Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Ricardo Berenson will defend the academic thesis Beyond Money Metrics Essays on Multidimensional Poverty. Welcome to everybody online and on site. Uh, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Thank you, Prorector. Beyond Money Metrics, Essays on Multidimensional Poverty is the title of my dissertation, which I'm defending today. Thank you for being here. Excuse me. There is a little glitch. Yes, this is the one. Poverty and the eradication of poverty in particular is a top global priority in the development agenda. Traditionally, we've measured poverty using income and consumption data. And this is a straightforward approach that many of us will be familiar with, for example, the World Bank's poverty lines. Uh, but is this enough? Enter the capability approach. This is a philosophical theory that is challenging this perception that poverty can be measured only by resource-based uh, data, like income and consumption. It argues that poverty is not just the lack of money, but is not having the capability to realize one's own poten potential as a human being. That means, basically, not being able to live a life that you value, a live, live a life worth living. So it considers money as an important resource, certainly, but not the only one. Being deprived in income, for example, doesn't mean that you are deprived in, in other dimensions of poverty, in other aspects of well-being, and vice versa. So this theory basically inspires, is one of the main theories that inspired the conceptualization of multidimensional poverty, how we think of poverty as having multiple dimensions. And it's been operationalized, it's been put into practice using different approaches. And we are seeing it more often now at the core of the policy debate. For example, here you see in the top picture that the UN Sustainable Development Goals is actually using a very similar definition to the one I provided before um, based on Amartya Sen quote, uh, who is the, the one that introduced the capability approach. We also see multidimensional poverty and the capability approach being reflected in the UN Human Development Index. We also see it in the Multidimensional Poverty Index. We see even the World Bank using now its own poverty, multidimensional poverty measure. So it's, it's part, it's becoming increasingly more integrated in the policy debate. So we have monetary measures and we have multidimensional measures. Which one shall we use when we are trying to measure poverty? And in particular, the focus of this dissertation is looking at how we measure impact of development programs, of anti-poverty programs, in reducing poverty. And the way we define poverty has important policy and program implications in how we design these programs and policy, in how we, for example, target population that we consider as poor, how we decide to scale up interventions, policies, programs, and most importantly for the focus of this dissertation, how we actually measure the impact of a program or a policy, whether defining whether it works, it doesn't work, the definition and the measurement of poverty is at the, bay, at the core of it. The key question in, in this dissertation is to answer whether using a multidimensional approach actually helps us better understand the impacts of development programs in poverty reduction. And to do this, I conducted three impact evaluations. The first one is the, an impact evaluation using quasi-experimental methods 
to assess the impact of the national cash transfer program in Peru, called Juntos. And we compared, in this case, two different multidimensional indices. One is the standard global multidimensional index, and the other one is a tailored index to the theory of change of the program, to the objectives of the program. And as you can see in the map here, we assign households in certain districts to receive the cash transfers, that is the treatment group, and other households in control districts or comparison districts where they didn't receive the cash transfers. The second impact evaluation is a randomized control trial in Uganda that evaluated the impact of the combination of microfinance and farming extension services. Farming indicating a combination of both agriculture and livestock. And in this case, we built a multidimensional outcome index that is tailored, again, to the objectives of the program. We also looked at labor outcomes. In this randomized design, households were allocated to four different groups. One received both microfinance and farming extension services, another one only microfinance services, a third one only farming extension services, that is training and delivery of improved seeds or vaccines for animals, and then a pure comparison group that didn't receive any of the interventions. And the third impact evaluation is a subsample of the second one, but we follow these households on a monthly basis for two years. The main idea was to look at the seasonal variations across the different months in the farming cycle and with a focus specifically on food security, understood also as a dimension of poverty. I'll take a few minutes to talk about the methodological approach to create the multidimensional indices in studies one and two, the first two impact evaluations I talked about. We use the Alcair Foster method. This is just a picture to illustrate how it looks. This is the, the global standard multidimensional poverty index. We tailor this to the specific program outcomes in, in both studies, but just to, to illustrate how the index is built using different dimensions, and then within each dimension, you have a set of indicators. And then you use different thresholds or cutoff points to define who is poor and who is not. And we use this method mainly because it allows us to capture the proportion of those who are multidimensionally poor. It also allows us to customize it, to tailor it to different contexts. And it also allows us to track populations over time. All of these are very useful approaches in impact evaluation research. However, it has certain limitations as well. When you define which indicators to use, which dimensions to include in your index, you have to make normative judgments. And these are subject, this can be subjective and therefore questionable. Another limitation or challenge is that you might not have the right data or the right quality of data to build the index. And then merging all these dimensions and indicators together into a single number can be a good reference, but also risks oversimplifying the such a complex phenomenon such as poverty. Before I, I describe the, the outcome indicators in, in the third study, I'll just go back to say that the important thing to overcome these limitations, which you can also find in different other poverty measures, including poverty lines, is that you need to be very clear on how the index is built. You need to explain and justify the reasoning behind the selection of the parameters. That means the selection of the indicators, the dimensions, the weights that you give each of them, and also the thresholds or cutoff points that you are using. And for the third paper, we you, since it focuses on food security, we use the food insecurity scale 
and the household dietary diversity, both contrasted measures in the field. These three impact evaluations contribute to the field by, um, by using real-world data, by adapting and testing a multidimensional measure in a microeconomic setting. Remember that usually this these measures have been implemented mostly for comparative purposes at the macro level, at the country level, or at the regional level. In this case, we are testing this in a micro scale in impact evaluation of a particular policy or program. There is some literature that is relatively new in, in this space, but this, this paper, this dissertation with three papers is actually contributing to the field in, in this uh, manner. And then, it provides practical policy insights that, that can inform decisions in regarding uh, better programs that are going to be targeting poverty. Let me share with you three key findings. The first one is that tailored indices matter. In impact evaluation research, the recommendation is to customized the index to the theory of change of the program, to the objectives of the program, rather than having one size fits all uh, index. For example, in the case of Juntos, in the first impact evaluation, we saw that the tailored index provided more nuanced insights compared to the standard global index. In this way, we are able to see the, the differential effects of the program in the multiple dimensions of poverty, the unintended and both the intended uh, effects of the program. The second recommendation is to go beyond the aggregate numbers. Like practitioners and policymakers are going to probably refer to this one number because it's practical, it's straightforward. But this number can oversimplify, we spoke about, uh, about it in, in the, some of the limitations and challenges early on. We need to dive deeper into the dimensions, into the ind uh, indicators, to really know the multidimensionality of the impacts of the programs. And this is clearly reflected in the second study, in the randomized evaluation of the microfinance uh, multiplied approach, where we, you remember we had three treatment groups, one that combined microfinance and farming services, and the others that delivered the programs independently. There we saw that both, uh, sorry, the three treatment arms reduced the incidence of poverty. But it was only when we looked closer into the indicators and the, and the dimensions that we realized that it was only the microfinance multiplied approach, the bundled approach, uh, treatment that had impacts in all dimensions, whereas the individual programs had impacts only in one of the dimensions, the one closer to their theory of change. This is related to the third takeaway, which is that multifaceted interventions, such as the microfinance multiplied approach, can enhance multidimensional impacts. And a word of caution, based on evidence from the third paper, is that you cannot really integrate any program to achieve results in any outcome. You have to be strategic related to which programs you integrate and what outcomes you want to measure. In, in the third paper, we didn't find any significant results in reduction of food insecurity. And it's likely because the, the programs in the bundle didn't write, have the right mechanisms to actually address that outcome, at least in the time frame that the the study took. And then thinking about the future, we, we consider that based on the evidence provided by this research, that multidimensional measurement can be quite useful for informing policy in terms of assessing the impacts of development and anti-poverty programs. However, it should not replace monetary metrics, it should actually complement it. And as we move forward, we encourage further research to keep refining the multidimensional measurement to be able to better understand, have a more comprehensive um, approach to 
measuring the multidimensionality of poverty uh, in using impact evaluation methods. Thank you all for listening. And I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, the opposition now will be opened by Professor Nielsen. Uh, Professor Nielsen is also chair in public policy and governance at UNU Merit Maastricht University and was the chair of the assessment committee. Respected candidates, I would like to congratulate you with the completion of your thesis, where you wrote three chapters that each investigate the impacts of development intervention, cash transfers, microfinance, combined with agricultural training, on multidimensional poverty and multidimensional outcomes, using in chapter two a quasi-experimental design, and chapter three and four use an experimental setup. I think you did a very nice job in describing what you did, how, and why. What I sometimes missed was what your results now actually really mean. So I just changed my mind in the last five minutes. I was gonna ask you something about chapter four, but I think I will start with chapter two. So in chapter two, you look at the Juntos program using a quasi-experimental approach, match, diff, and diff, and you find very little evidence of juntas having an effect on multi-dimensional poverty on your index. And when you disaggregate that, you also do not find much except for fuel use in safe water. You suggest that based on similar improvements in the control group, there is no additional, cash, uh, no additional effect of the cash transfer. So my first question is, do you have a sense of what explains these improvements in the control group, given that you're looking at a relatively short period of time in only four years? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your kind words and for your question, highly esteemed opponent. Uh, it's true in the, in the impact evaluation of Juntos, we don't find significant results, at least not consistently or, or in a robust way. And we, we think this could be due to, to a few factors. And then I'll also talk a little bit about the, the two different outcomes that we use, uh, the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index and also the, the tailored one. So I think one of the potential challenges that, that we're facing here is that some of the baseline values already for most of these indicators were very high. Like, a relatively low proportion of the population were deprived in many of the indicators that we are assessing. For example, attending primary school, or, or in the case of the, the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, child mortality. So in this, this could be also a factor that the results might have been there, but were so small that the program didn't have the statistical power to detect the, the changes. So, while we do power calculations, we, one of the concerns is that we might actually not be powered enough to measure the changes in all, across all the indicators that we considered. And something also that we realized when I said that one of the key takeaways was that um, the tailored index was more provided more nuanced information compared to the, the global one. I also, when I say that without having statistically significant results, for instance, it, it's, it's a point that I would also like to address. Here, I think when, when I talk about nuances, is that we are looking at, at descriptive statistics in the sense that, for example, the, the indicators in the multidimensional global index had some values that were extremely small, like the, the average, for example, child mortality was 0.03%, and some indicators that had extremely high uh, values, close to 98, 99% of the population, for example, uh, attending uh, primary school. And so I think this diversity did, didn't really help uh, in, in creating like a robust index. In the tailored index, the, 
the proportions were much more even. Still, so we didn't really find significant effects there because I think one of the main challenges had, might have been the, the high baseline values and, and this probably low statistical power. Can I, can I just follow up on that? Because indeed, I observed that school enrollment rates, for example, so you look at uh, whether they miss schools or are they not enrolled, and indeed, it's only you know, two mm percent -hmm. or three percent, right? And then mm -hmm. you find an increase of a one percentage point. So my question would also be to what extent, you know, do you really care then about getting that value still up, especially if we think about conditional cash transfers are very costly, right, to mm -hmm. implement because you yeah. need to monitor all these conditions. So then from a policy perspective, do we then really need such a condition like Mm -hmm. You have to send your kids to school because people are already doing this. Yeah, this is an excellent point. In this case, I think from an impact evaluation perspective, it will be interesting to see also what dynamics or what effects the program is having on other set of indicators. In this impact, eva in, in, well, in the dissertation and this impact evaluation in particular, we didn't look into this because we only had data related to the conditionalities. So we couldn't expand. This is one of the limitations of, of, the, of this chapter. And I think it's something, this I think goes beyond the dissertation itself, but my opinion based on the evidence based on cash transfers is that maybe the conditionalities need to be rethink, rethought. Uh, the evidence suggests in general that unconditional cash transfers are quite effective or, or as effective even to conditional cash transfers. And for some reason in Latin America, we have focused more on conditional cash transfers as opposed to in many African countries that use unconditional cash transfer with very similar results. So I think this is a, a, a good policy question to whether the conditionalities need to be redefined or whether do we need them at all. Okay, thank you. Do I still have time? One minute. <laughs> One minute. Okay. Um, very quickly to, uh, to chapter four, uh, because there you look at food security as um, an outcome. And my understanding has always been that food security is typically a long-term outcome. But then you look at monthly outcomes on food security, right? You look at this variation in, in the month. And then if you look at figure one on page 78, you actually see that there's quite some variation in your food security outcome. But then this is all self-reported. So how can we be sure that this is not just noise in the data that you're actually picking up here? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for try, your Try to keep your answer short, given the one minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the main idea of this was w that we wanted to see the, the trends in, like, in across seasons, ac every month. And so we provide information on descriptive statistics, but also the, the regression analysis. We, we don't really find, like, we see some fluctuation, but we rarely find robust and sustained significant changes across the time. And this could be to the, the, the fact that food security changes might take a bit longer to detect. And in this case, we decided to measure it because we had the panel, we wanted to see whether we were already observing some seasonal variations, uh, but it wasn't the case. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Lan Yao, who holds a chair in Development Economics at the Free University of Amsterdam and who is online. He is also a member of the Assessment Committee. Thank you very much. Um, respected candidate, uh, I would like first of all to congratulate you on a, a very interesting and thought-provoking thesis. Um, I found it really quite helpful and useful to um, to discover what I thought was very important in your thesis is that you find often that the results were kind of non-results and that the impacts were not the, there as might have originally been expected in the original designs of the of the projects. And I think it's really good to have empirical records of where these evaluations really do point to success and but also where they point to less than uh, 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 you know fully encouraging results. And this I think provides really good empirical evidence uh, also on some of those examples. and I think that's really very valuable. Um, 
I would like to ask you a little bit about the whole multidimensional poverty measurement approach. On the one hand, I think it's a very uh, uh, powerful approach to thinking about poverty measurement because I think what's so critical in the multidimensional approach is the fact that people might be deprived in various dimensions simultaneously. And prior to the multidimensional approach uh, 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 that was sort of pioneered, I guess, initially with Amartya Sen's work, but then later on with Alkir and Foster's implementation of these measures, we really have a mechanism now to simultaneously look at the deprivations that are occurring jointly along various dimensions at the same time. And that's really quite important. However, I'd like to approach you a little bit on, on, on the particular approach that you used, um, in light also of your own remarks regarding both the limitations and the challenges in multidimensional poverty measurement, as well as your, your key findings where you were em emphasizing the importance of tailoring indices and going beyond sort of aggregate numbers. My, my main concern is with the sort of Altier and Foster method and measure uh, and, and and to contrast that with potentially another approach would be which would be much more simple, which is say to use Venn diagrams and to simple simply depict when there is overlap in deprivations in a very simple illustrative type of way rather than in a number that's being generated through the Alkier and Foster uh, method, because as you mentioned in your in your uh, presentation, you know, to implement the procedure requires making subjective uh, decisions about the weights, about which indicators to use, the, uh, the specific poverty lines that apply to the different dimensions. All these have to be choices that have to be made, and there's an element of arbitrariness in all of them. Um, and then later on, you mentioned you would like to encourage the tailoring of indices to the specific purposes at hand in a particular uh, context. And the question is, how realistic is it that you will get a consensus around all these different dimensions and these different arbitrary judgments and subjective uh, uh, weights that are being applied? Um, and and can you actually hope to to have to reach a kind of agreement across different observers as to the the diff, the, the meaning of these multidimensional uh, measures? Thank you for the kind words and, and for your questions, highly esteemed opponent. I, I think this is a, a key point. The, the Alkair Foster method, I'll, I'll start addressing the, the subjectivity of, of the matter and then I'll, I'll talk about the idea of the Venn diagrams, which I really like. The, I think many indices when trying to measure poverty, if not all, at some point or another, are making normative judgments. There's no perfect index that, that will be flawless. And I think the important thing will be to explain clearly what are the reasoning, what is the reasoning behind the selection of all of these parameters. And this could be to strengthen it, to make it more robust. It, this could be also not only the job of a researcher sitting in, in a room on its own, but it should be a coordinated and collaborative effort talking to policymakers, talking to practitioners in development organizations, talking to grassroots organizations uh, in the field to try to come up with the right indicators or the most appropriate indicators and what to the particular context are going to be the thresholds that would make more sense to define who will fall under this cutoff point or, or go above it. So I think there is no way really to escape this uh, normative judgment uh, basis, in, in my opinion. But I think it can be the subjectivity can be reduced by having a more open conversation and having a debate with different policy stakeholders and similarly to the weights as well. I, I like the idea of having a sort of agreement on how we approach poverty. I think the agreement in this case is, is the methodological approach when we're using the Alcair Foster method, kind of following all, all the different steps. Um, but when it comes thinking about an agreement in which are the dimensions and indicators that we should, for example, always be considering, 
might be a bit challenging in impact evaluation research because the if we are assessing a program that is targeting, for example, uh, let's say the microcredit, will have very different dimensions to address compared to uh, a farming uh, extension service program. So it will be very hard to come up with a standardized way to measure it. But there could be some, some way in providing guidelines in, okay, these are the, the most common ways or the most common indicators that you should potentially be using, or these are the dimensions that you should be embracing. Um, but I will leave some leeway for the researcher in consultation, as I mentioned, with other stakeholders to decide what are the right parameters for each specific impact evaluation. Um, regarding the Venn diagram, I've seen the archive foster method also compare um, how, what's the overlap in MPI, the Multidimensional Poverty Index, to, for example, um, a monetary monetary poverty. No? And then you can see that there is some overlap in the populations, but also that some populations that have different, like not overlapping groups. In this case, this is also one of the limitations in, in this dissertation is that we didn't have data on consumption and we didn't have data on income that would allow us to create those indicators and have this nice comparison or illustration of, in a Venn diagram, which I think I, I tried creating one, but but it wasn't like good enough to to include it in the in the thesis. Thank you very much. If I could perhaps just follow up, um, and this um, this is more in the nature of asking you your opinion and trying to take advantage of the fact that you've had this experience and you've really thrown yourself into the details of all of this multidimensional measurement. I wanted to ask you your opinion about what I regard as a possible sort of Achilles heel or compromise that we embark on whenever we try to measure multidimensional poverty. And that's the, the it's, it's something that's, that, that's that's in light of the indicators that that you that you referred to the the fact that we have to choose indicators the the, the big challenge with multidimensional measurement is that we need to have indicators of the different dimensions that we consider important for the same households right so we need to have data that capture say educational outcomes health outcomes living standards outcomes or whatever other dimensions you might be interested in all for the same households in order to be able to capture the jointness of the of, of these possible deprivations but that seems to go completely against where the profession is going when it comes to collecting good data in the sense that we know more and more about collecting good income or living standards data by doing very specific very detailed household surveys that collect consumption or income data we know more and more about how we need to go well beyond looking at schooling attendance to actually measure educational outcomes. We need to actually you know, measure educational outcomes. We need to measure health outcomes directly by, involved, by, by, by a variety of different tests and so on, rather than perhaps some simple self-reported in data. So the profession is moving in the direction of dedicated surveys that, capture, that can calculate and capture really the, the nuances of the different dimensions that we're going to. And yet the multidimensional poverty approach requires that we have this information simultaneously all in a single survey at this level of the household. How do you regard that tension? Um, are we always going to be doomed to measuring multidimensional poverty with very crude proxy variables? simply because we don't have the kind of quality surveys that can really collect the nuanced and the, the detailed information along for each of these dimensions simultaneously at the same time for a given household. What's your opinion? Yeah. Can, can I ask you to give your opinion in one line in light of the time and the other questions that are awaiting? So if we get to a second round, you can get to a more elaborate answer. Okay, I'll, I'll be brief. Hopefully we have time to, to expand. But I think if we're looking at impact evaluation research, which is the focus of this dissertation, collecting or, or pulling the, the right, the, the resources to have a comprehensive survey that will encapsulate all modules that will be able to allow you to build all the indices that you need is, is going to be key. Whether that's always possible, 
I guess not, but the suggestion would be as a, if you were a policymaker or or a researcher looking for to to build this this type of um, research is yeah to to have enough funds to be able to to conduct a large scale survey to be able to to measure multidimensional poverty comprehensively. We the opposition go. will be continued by uh, Professor Bigeri, who is uh, a chair in Applied Economics at the University of Florence and also uh, a member of the assessment committee. The floor is yours. Yes, uh, Professor, let me congratulate with you, Morel. Uh, I am going to ask you a detailed question, I would say, uh, which is about chapter four and is about the additional analysis you have done about heterogeneous analysis by distance to the near uh, market. Uh, I would like you to discuss uh, the results you found uh, of these additional analysis because I found it uh, very interesting because it gives more um, understanding. And uh, then uh, um, rethinking about your thesis and reading again, I'm, I'm, I'm having worked in Uganda uh, with data I collected, um, uh, I'm, I'm wondering what about uh, female household, head household, and uh, what is the contribution of these macro credits for them? Some of them are widow, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I would like to know about this idea of um, household insecurity and how these additional analysis gave you the opportunity to understand better or not. Uh, the phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you for your question, highly esteemed opponent. I would kindly ask you to to rephrase your question, if possible. The audio wasn't very clear, so I understood that you wanted my opinion on some on the on some background on on the on chapter four, but I didn't fully understand exactly what. I would rephrase. Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Better, maybe. So the point is uh, about related to the additional analysis you conducted for chapter four. I found it very interesting, especially the heterogeneous analysis by the distance uh, to the nearest market. Uh, so if you can uh, retake those results and uh, think also about the composition of the different households and their uh, household insecurity, then you were working on diversity. So if you can elaborate on, on the results. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So if I understood correctly, it's, it's related to the heterogeneous treatment effects in, in chapter four. So what we did in, in that section of the analysis is look at the heterogeneous effects on households that were better off in terms of um, ownership of assets. We created an, an index as a proxy of wealth based on ownership of, of a number of assets. And in this case, we, we found that households that were poorer in this wealth index had more or, or reduced food insecurity at more points in time compared to the control group, especially or specifically those in the microfinance group. Now, while we do see a few data points indicated significant changes, in some of the seasons, it's, it's not sustained over time, but, but during the first year of the, of the program, we do see those, that trend in particular. It's interesting because it kind of goes against the literature in, the, in microfinance, which suggests that usually microfinance bet, uh, benefits more those who are better off among the poor. And a potential explanation here, it's, it's a little bit, counterintuitive, this finding, um, based on the evidence base. A potential explanation is that it could potentially have been that the baseline values for food insecurity were already very low in southwestern Uganda. If there is a, a picture I included in the dissertation that shows the map in different colors, and the region of Uganda where the study took place is in green color, which means that it has a very low incidence of food insecurity. So it could have been that, yeah, in terms of food insecurity, both control and treatment households were particularly, 
particularly well off and then the microfinance program managed to fill in some gaps and and kind of and improve food uh, security for those particular households yeah but then it's yeah I, I realize that it's a bit counterintuitive if if that's what you wanted to to pick on that is very interesting thank you Associate Professor in Social Protection and Public Policy at UNU Merit um, and Maastricht University. Dear candidate, dear Ricardo, I also would like to add to my colleagues on congratulating you on finishing this thesis and the interesting input also for the field from the um, empirical aspect also on the impact evaluation. My question is going to take you a little bit a step uh, um, higher in the sense of the theory that you have applied. And I would like to challenge you here and challenge something that you started with about the capability approach when you explained to us that it is a theory. And I would challenge you that it is not a theory, but rather it is a framework for thinking. I would also like to challenge you that what you are telling us in your thesis is merely a version of what Sen calls as functionings. It's just a moment in time that if we go back to what you are telling us that you're trying to do with the capability approach is somewhat, I would argue, superficial. So if we would go back to this idea that the capability approach is a much larger framework for thinking, and looking at your journey in this research, how would you uh, envision and also reply to this critique in future research and also policy applications? How would you critique your own methodology that it, again, only addresses a very small part of what Sen talks about? And how do you think that we can actually, or can we, integrate the capability approach um, into impact evaluation beyond just this multidimensional methodology that essentially, according to sense terminology, only captures functioning and not beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question, esteemed opponent, and your kind words. It's, it's always hard to translate an abstract concept into practice in, in and quantifying such a, a like yeah an a abstract phenomenon such as poverty and a complex phenomenon such as poverty and and you can come in yeah with the capability approach which is I agree much broader than what an index would look like in in any scenario most likely I think the the approach that ten cent takes is is basically telling us that poverty goes beyond resources and is is about the capability approach no suggests that it's about the opportunities that you have or the freedoms that you have to to realize your own potential to like to build the life that that you will value and how to translate this concept into a number, it's, it's, it's very complicated. And in my view, I don't think it's, it's fully possible to capture the whole concept into, into an index. There will be always challenges. But with the available data that you have, I think we have, as researchers, we have the responsibility to do our best and collect data and use this data to try to represent to the best possible uh, in the best possible way the what what a program is is impacting in in different dimensions of poverty so let me perhaps rephrase a bit all these ideas that are coming as i speak so when when we run impact evaluations we want to learn how a program is working how effective it is and I think rather than just looking at money and income and what you consume in a particular period of time, 
I think it's also responsible to look at many other dimensions. And I think the framework that Zen provides is a useful one in terms of trying to assess the impacts of your program and not just limit yourself to, to resources. So you, you do want to look at how the program is providing opportunities for you to live the life that you want to live. And in that sense, for policymakers, it's important to have that information to be able to tailor and, and design policies that are actually going to address those capabilities. Um, and I think by not doing that, we are missing on important information for effective policy making. So I, while it's complex and can be challenging, I would still encourage to try to take the approach, sense approach, and keep uh, refining the way we use it in, in impact evaluation research. That's why when I concluded, I also added this uh, point about further research to keep refining the methodological approach and in particular uh, poverty measurement. And yeah, related to, to are we? <laughs> okay, so I can stop now to give the opportunity okay for, for more now. questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, just, just to finish, it's true that also the, the multidimensional poverty index will mainly be capturing the functionings, um, which are the, the, the state of living, let's say. The, um, but I think it, it can also be argued that it's capturing in some way or another the capability as well, your, your, your ability or your capacity to use the resources available to live the life that you want. For example, if, if you're talking about um, improving, um, for example, health, like having better health, um, it's a functioning, but the indicators within health are going to be the resources that are going to be able to give you the freedom or the opportunities to achieve that functioning. And that's the capability. So in a way, you could also make the argument that in, in one way or another, you are addressing capabilities as well. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Dietrich, Assistant Professor at UNU Merit in Maastricht University. The floor is yours. Dear candidate, dear Ricardo, first of all, uh, congratulations on your work. I think you really provide very relevant uh, evidence on the impacts of uh, two probably the most important anti-poverty policies. Um, I really like the last two studies where you test different interventions and use different data sources to test what works and what is not working. Um, my questions regard the fact that I don't always really fully follow the interpretation of the results. Uh, and particularly in study two, so chapter three, where you look at um, the multiplier effects, um, you aim to test whether the microfinance multiplier model has generated multiplier effects and then you have the treatment where you combine um, microfinance with agricultural services, and then you have these two treatment arms where you only provide, where, where only one of the two is provided. Um, when I look at the results, uh, particularly for your uh, multidimensional poverty indicator, um, and for reference, that will be on page 61, I can see that um, the joint intervention has the largest effect. But even if you look at the separate effects of microfinance and farming, you still see that the effects are significant. And actually, the sum of these two impacts is at least the same as the joint intervention. So my interpretation um, of this finding would be um, that there is no multiplier effect. It actually, if, if you add up the two impacts, it leads to the same results. So my question here is, um, to ask you to please elaborate a wide read from the results that offering both treatments uh, jointly unfolds additional multiplier effects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words and for your questions, same opponent. The, the whole idea of the multiplying effect is it's at the core of, of this chapter and is the basis of the integration of the multi microfinance multiplied approach. It, it gets inspiration, as I also briefly explained in, in the dissertation, from the, the 
positive effects that the graduation model, which is combining different components, uh, provides uh, a, a cost-effective solution. While it, it can be a, an expense, relatively expensive program, it can, can have like significant impact. So this idea inspired the whole multidimensional, the whole um, microfinance multiplied approach. So that's one of the objectives of, of testing whether this is actually achieving multiplying effects, or in other words, like having stronger effects uh, than providing the program separately. I like your, your perspective. The, the way I see it, and this, this is also part of an interesting debate, is that the, this, the, the evaluation design is running regressions for each particular treatment arm compared to the control group separately. So we have one regression for the bundled approach and, and other two regressions for, for the individual treatment. So when I don't, don't know if we necessarily need to add up the coefficients of the two separate regressions because those will be scenarios where the program would have been delivered alone to that particular population without the other program at all. So we will be talking about different populations. If you were like an NGO implementing this program, um, if you were to say that this program has stronger effects, like it's, it's, or is it's more powerful to have separate interventions, um, then you will be telling the NGO, well, you either implement microfinance alone or agriculture alone, but you are not advising them to in integrate them, right? So first you're going to have only one side of the effects or of one of the treatment, not both. So I don't see necessarily that we need to, to add them up. And, and the other thing that we observe in, in the multidimensional index is that when we look at the different dimensions and, and how it affects different indicators, while the incidence of multidimensional poverty does reduce in all treatment arms, the microfinance multiplied treatment arm reduces um, or increases access to, to credit and also increases the adoption of good agricultural practices and also increases the adoption um, of improved seeds and vaccines for animals. Whereas if you deliver the programs individually, microfinance only increases access to finance and agriculture only increases the adoption of good agricultural practices. Um, so I still see that the, there are stronger effects in multiple dimensions and also the coefficient individually looking at it is, is, high, is higher in, in, the, in the microfinance multiplied group. And also if you look at the labor outcomes, it's also interesting to see that it's only the, the microfinance it, it, the microfinance multiplied program increases more labor in the farm. Whereas if you deliver microfinance only, more people are start to work in their own businesses off the farm, outside the farm. And if you deliver only farming services, you are increasing farm labor, but significantly decreasing self-employment and also increasing wage work. Like, people looking for jobs. Usually, I am assuming this, this could be seasonal work during the lean periods, but in this particular study, we don't have data for, for on a monthly basis. So again, um, I would say that the microfinance multiplied approach in that case provides more interesting or more positive results from a practitioner and policymaker's perspective than the individual ones. Given the time, uh, given the I time, think yeah. we have to postpone further discussion on this point <laughs> till after the defense. And the opposition will be continued by Professor Monet, who is Professor Emeritus of Econometrics of Technical Change at UNU Merit Maastricht University. Thank you, Pro Rector. Dear candidate, uh, my congratulations also. It's a nice piece of work. And for me, who am not a specialist in, uh, in uh, development economics and poverty, it's quite interesting. I, I learned quite a bit reading your thesis. I would have a general question, a very general question. Um, and you have been doing work on the conditional cash transfer program in Peru, on uh, farming extension services in Uganda, 
There have been other studies looking at cash transfer programs in other parts of the world. Some uh, uh, research has been done on uh, school attendance in India and so on. So you have a lot of interventions. You have a lot of ways of uh, evaluating the interventions. You use different uh, econometric methods to, to look at the, uh, the treatment effect. Uh, in your case, for instance, you only have the intention to treat in fact. In other cases, you also have the average treatment effect on the treated. You have differences in different regions of the world in which these programs are uh, operating. So in the end, I'm asking somebody like me who is not a specialist, what is the general conclusion of all this? Can we say something general about what kind of program works, where, under which conditions, so that, for instance, if we have a new case like South Africa or I don't know, Lesotho or somewhere, and there is a question of alleviating poverty, we don't have time to do another treatment evaluation, especially mm -hmm. since we want long-term results and not short-term results. Can we get any kind of information from your past research that has been done? Thank you for your kind comments and for your questions, highly esteemed opponent. I think this is a, a key question in, in impact evaluation research. We cannot simply continue doing always small impact evaluations every time. I think as, as the evidence base grows, we need to learn from, from it and have generalizable uh, lessons as well. I, th I would say this also goes a little bit beyond the, the scope of the dissertation, but in my opinion, I think there are a few interventions that have, that, have proved this path to scale, that they have the potential to actually have the, the, to provide significant positive results in, in improving people's lives. I think one of the key things that we could still add to, to that evidence base is trying to test these interventions using um, multidimensional indices to be seen, but, but the evidence base in general suggests that, for example, cash transfer is one of the most effective ways of reducing poverty. And there are different ways in which money can be delivered. It can be conditional, um, unconditional. It can be delivered through uh, electronic platforms like mobile money. It can be cash-based. So there are all these questions. Now, I think the evidence base shows that it does work in different contexts. Uh, it has been tested multiple times with rigorous impact evaluations. I think the questions now are, are more about the delivery mechanisms, um, how cost-effective it is, and whether you give a, a big lump sum of money or just a small um, disbursements over time. So I think the, the universal basic income as another way of cash transfer is now also part of the, of the academic uh, debate. Uh, so I would say related to this dissertation, cash transfers is one of the, the most uh, effective ways of reducing poverty. Another one that I mentioned briefly when Stefan was, was um, asking the question is, is related to, to this idea of multifaceted programs. The evidence based on the gradation out of poverty approach that was originally tested in Bangladesh, then replicated in multiple countries. There's an impact evaluation that tested this in seven countries in different continents and got positive uh, results. Now it's being implemented in different settings with displaced populations, for instance, and more evidence is coming in that it keeps getting positive results. So I would put another bet on that one. Um, and the microfinance multiplied approach is one particular way in which we can integrate programs. Thank you. Ricardo Berenson, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return. The meeting is adjourned.
The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. Long road, I don't waste no time. Break rules because fate decides. With the team and we chase the light. I make a move, fall down, shake it off. I hate to lose, bad branch, break it off. No room for negativity, praise and love. Prepare for deep park cause we're taking off. Get the mileage,
I would say that your thinking is the process which is your outcome. Mm. Think <laughs> <of dimensional. laughs> Ooh, you shall send the bucket. Your thinking is a cash transfer, not in poverty reduction. <laughs> you see, I get The meeting is reopened. Ricardo Berenson. The degree committee here present online and on site has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense, and in view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant to you the degree of doctor. Professor Gassman is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor now to take the floor. Please all rise. 
Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present and online, I hereby confer upon you, Ricardo Morel Berenson, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by customs and law. As evidence of this, you will receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the supervisor affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Dr. Morel, dear Ricardo, congratulations to your doctoral thesis uh, title. Also on behalf of uh, Nyasha and Bruno, your other supervisors. It is delightful to stand here today and celebrate this major achievement with you. It has been our privilege to accompany you on your PhD journey up to this day. We are very proud of you. And this degree is well deserved, so congratulations, Dr. Morel. In your thesis, you investigate whether the implementation of a multidimensional framework for assessing development interventions produces an improvement in understanding their effectiveness in poverty reduction. This is a very important research question. Your work highlights that to fully understand how to fight poverty and vulnerability, it is necessary to include non-traditional indicators and metrics that go beyond material and monetary measures in program evaluation. Your analysis has important policy implications because it raises awareness of the complexities of poverty and it informs policymakers of the challenges in designing, implementing and scaling up policies to contribute to improving the living conditions of the most vulnerable population groups. Dear Ricardo, you produced a very interesting thesis and doing a PhD next to a job is and remains a very hard task. It requires stamina and determination, both of which you have. To give you an example, out of the 17 fellows that started the dual career PhD program in 2017, you are the sixth to successfully defend the thesis. Many of your peers have given up in the meantime. As you were advancing in your PhD, you were also getting promoted at work and moving into higher positions with greater responsibilities at your workplace. You had to navigate challenges um, ranging from minor ones, such as us requesting additional robustness checks, to major crises like the coup d'etat in Myanmar, where you actually had to leave the country pretty abruptly. But despite all these challenges, we never saw you lose your calm or say anything out of line. Maybe this is because I've been thinking about that, and maybe this is because you are living in a place where people usually go to on vacation. The island of Gran Canaria is clearly invigorating, allowing for a good work-life balance. It has been a pleasure supervising you, and I'm also talking on behalf of Nyasha and Bruno. You're a very private person, you know, and we must admit that even after all these years, we still do not know many personal details about you. So that is why I'm even more delighted to see today, you know, oh, there is a wife and oh, there is a little daughter here. So to get to know them uh, uh, as well. What we have observed is that you are very determined and you're very polite. So all there, there were moments when we became slightly desperate because of your passion for the MPI. 
<laughs> and in the end, but in the end, you did exactly what you said you were going to do, and even more so, and that's quite an achievement. Dear Ricardo, a doctoral title is the ability, or is the expression of the ability to independently do research. You have demonstrated this ability impressively over the last few years, and you fully deserve to be called Dr. Morel from now on. Moreover, you can combine this ability with your impressive field experience, which you have accumulated over the years. And we are sure that we will hear a lot more from you in the future. So we wish you all the best for your future. And we would like to extend also the congratulations, not just to you, but of course, also to your family, especially to your wife and your daughter. And I think actually your daddy will have a little bit more time, hopefully, from now on for you. Congratulations. <laughs> Dear Dr. Berenson, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. And I would like to extend also the congratulations to your family who is here. Um, let me take this opportunity to thank the members of the uh, assessment committee and the other members of the Corona here present for their work and congratulate the supervisors for the work well done. Having said that, I declare the ceremony ended. Joshua, can we please yeah. have the online people?